last time so that I can make the, um, the connection. So let me try to write a bunch of equations on, on, on the board. So what you will find is the paper is the following thing. So we were looking at uh, defocusing NLS. So u is complex and x is in Rd. And what we want, and what we want, and so we did a change of variable. So we change variable. Right, so this is first self-similar and then that dy dynamical rescaling, and we arrive to the following equation. So we arrive exactly to the following system. So d tau rho, so I'm going to write it down. It's minus rho Laplace Psi minus mu L R minus 1 over 2 rho. Oh, okay, so I'll just put a rho minus, I have this, I have twice dz Psi plus mu z times dz rho. And I have this second equation, so I have a rho d tau psi is equal to b square Laplace rho minus, and I have these ugly guys, I have grad psi squared plus mu r minus 2 psi minus 1 plus mu lambda psi plus rho to the p minus 1 rho. Okay, so I just remind you that lambda, so z is, is the radial variable, huh? z is just if you want to uh, test the, the radial variable. What I call lambda is just z dz. And there are a bunch of parameters floating in the picture. So L, for example, if I am working with NLS, it's 4 over p minus 1. And R, it's 2 over 1 minus e. Uh, and I define, so mu, I think uh, the relation, I think that mu R minus 2 is 1 or some, something like this, is this parameter mu. So in fact, it all relates, everything is related to this. So the, the free parameter is e where E is some strictly positive parameter, okay? This is, this is necessary, and B is a function of time. B of tau is E to the minus theta. Okay, so it simply means that, okay, I have a bunch of numbers, but uh, it's, it's not the point. So I, ha I have a coupled system of two things here, and of course the key is that there is one parameter here, this B, I want to treat this B as a perturbation, okay? So this is, this is, uh, I need. Yeah, I want to treat this guy, right? Because there is exponential smallness in time. I want to treat this guy as 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 a perturbation. So let let me uh, uh, tell you what we're going to do today. We're going to run basically the program, and the program is the following. So first, do b equals zero. Uh, I'm going to call my equation star. So first, do b equals zero. So second, solve uh, or find find what I call rho p psi p p like profile stationary solution stationary solution to star. So this is what we started the other day, and this is equivalent to having a self-similar solution of compressible Euler uh, uh, with blow-up speed, with blow-up speed R. And then, and this is what I want to focus on today, study the stability problem. Okay, so this, 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 the stability problem is exactly this one. Remember, this is after renormalization. So if I want to make a, a blow-up solution of the root problem, what I need to do, I need to construct a global in time non-vanishing solution to this equation. And the way I'm going to do this is simply by taking my stationary solution there and construct initial data such that the corresponding uh, solution will be global in time and in some sense to be made precise, globally attracted by this profile. Okay, so this is this is the the the, the strategy. So the stability. Can you, can you 
still under the assumption that P is equal to zero? Or I, I say, say that again, so two, two, the number two is, is uh, so what, for B different from zero already? Uh, or? So, so B is here, B, 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 B. Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about in the strategy, you have one and two, so number two. Ah, so you're you absolutely right, so one, B equals zero, two, this is for B equals zero, you're absolutely right. Okay, so I solve absolutely. I find a stationary solution because B depends on time eh? anyway. So I find a stationary solution for this problem, which is simpler. And then I say this stationary solution, you, you see formally, if I tell you that the leading order term is some stationary in time tau function rho, this is exponentially small in time. So it's very reasonable to believe that maybe you can treat this as, 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 as a perturbation, right? It's, it's a very simple answer. Okay, so, so this is exactly what you want to do. But of course, you could say there is also, so my point is the following. This is the NLS equation written in phase and modulus. There is no B equals zero system for NLS. It doesn't make sense. But if I was to do this analogy, if I was to run the same program with fluids, then of course there is a B equals zero problem. And then I could simply make theorems about the B equals zero problem, which is exactly what we did. There is a whole range of stability analysis, which concerns Euler. And then you can ask yourself, if you could stabilize Brough profile in Euler, are they admissible? That is, are they such that I can also stabilize this problem? Okay, so this, this is why for, for uh, in between Euler and Avi so Stem. In principle, we would not do directly. Uh, if you wanted to do directly the Schrodinger equation, yes. to say, forget about Euler, I just want to do directly the, yeah. the, the, you'll have problems because you don't have okay. an interpretation of B equals zero. Absolutely, it doesn't make sense. So I need an analysis that treats, of course, B equals zero, but is, but is also able to treat B non zero. Okay? okay? Okay, yeah, please. Just to interrupt you again. Uh, e strictly positive yes. only corresponds to supercritical. No, no, absolutely not. B strictly positive is something that I enforced from scratch. I forced this parameter B to be some exponential. I'm sorry, these notations are awful. It's exponential of minus eta. E, 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 e is a number, okay? But, yes. but let me say it. So, again, so when I do, so this is what I, I, I said. So. If I ignore, if I do B equals zero, yeah. if I do Euler, <laughs> but you know, there is a free parameter when you renormalize Euler, All right. which is the blow-up speed. That is B because it's a two-parameter scaling symmetry. So if you look for self-similar solutions of Euler, there is a free parameter. Okay, this free parameter, it's so I call it. I call it so. The the, the this is what we call the blow-up speed. Okay, it's this parameter R. Okay, so it's exactly my E. Okay, this it's 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 set here. Okay, so so this free parameter for Euler or this free parameter here, I mean it's the same guy. Okay, so there's one free parameter. So I have I have always free parameter in my problem. I have dimension, dimension, I have L, which is the nonlinearity. So it's P or it's uh, you know it's or it's gamma if you're doing fluids, but this is L. And I have R, which is the blob speed. My question was, where do you see the supercriticality? Because this thing you could not do for... for the fact that your energy is supercritical, right? So it's already... Uh, so let me recall this briefly. And, 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 and let, let, no, but let me say these, these words again. So let me... So no, if it's too long... Uh, no, 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 it's not. I'm, I'm just... Uh, because I, 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 I wanted to uh, say this. So step one... I do B equals zero. Step two, I look for self-similar solution. Okay, so I want stationary solutions of this equation. Okay, and through an Emden transform, it maps my equation onto something that uh, maybe. Uh, so if you agree, I'll I'll just erase this so that I I will not. We'll just erase this so the strategy is clear, right? So I'll just erase this. So, so this is step two. So when, when I look at the stationary equation, stationary equation, after a change of variable, which is called a Nandan transform, I map my system. So x is log z. Uh, and, wh and what I have is exactly this. I have uh, delta d omega dx is minus delta 1, and delta d sigma dx is minus delta 2, okay, and delta 
delta 1, delta 2 are functions of omega and sigma only, not on x. Okay, so I've mapped myself onto something, and roughly when I draw the face portrait of this thing, what I see, if this is sigma, if this is omega, so maybe this is, I'm going to, because I'm going to need this later anyway, so let's just take a minute to redraw this. So if this is sigma, so this is my sonic line. So this is delta equals 0. Uh, this is the point which we call P4. And what I have is the following. So I need red, which I have here. So what we have is something like this. So this is the line. This is delta 1 equals 0. And I want to put myself in the situation where I have something like this. This is delta 2 equals 0. So I have a set like this. So this is the so-called point P2. And what I have is the following thing. So I have a trajectory which is going to do this. It's going to cross inside here, and then it's going to come back, and it's going to go here. OK, so may maybe I should, I should dash it. OK, so this is what I said la last, uh, and this, is the, this point is P5. Uh, it's this point here. OK, so what I said last time is the following thing. On this face portrait, there is a unique trajectory which comes from here. And it corresponds to the smooth radially symmetric solution. And in a certain range of parameters, so I need r to be less than r star of d and l, which is d plus l over l plus square root of d. OK, then in this range, the unique trajectory which, which comes here is going to cross through P2. And if I'm lucky, and I will need to discuss that, I'm going to go back to P4, which is self-similar decay, which is what I want. OK, so let, let me say these words again. So the, this unique trajectory is the unique smooth solution at the origin. OK, then it evolves. And I have this picture because I've made an assumption. I've made an assumption like this. And that's typically already in the supercritical range. Okay? Just asking for this to be the picture is already putting you away. But it's not enough. Uh, you're even further. This is what I call supercritical numerology. It's already a condition. So tip, tip, typically, when you write this condition, so, 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 so this is the typical con uh, con condition for Euler. So what I said the, the other time is that if you want for NLS, you want r, which is 2 over 1 minus c. You want e positive, so you want this bigger than 2. So this implies that 2 is less than r star. And this already demands, this demands d bigger than 5. That is, if you want a nice profile for Euler, you're already in the supercritical range. If you want this profile to be compatible with, with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, the NLS equation, that is, with the fact that this term can be treated as a perturbation, you need to be even beyond. Okay, so this is like there is a condition. It's like the Joseph Longhorn in some sense. You know, it's already telling you that you need to be f f further away. The algebra for fluid for Navier-Stokes is not the, the same. That is, equations are not exactly the same. This is exactly what you told me uh, at the first conference. The rho is not modulus of u square. Or is it modulus or not? Modulus? That's exactly the point. There are factors all over the place. So you do your algebra and you realize that, uh, um, if I remember well, I think I need r to be bigger than 2 plus l over 1 plus l. And when you do your algebra, you, you discover that this demands. So, so what, what demands this is, so, 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 so this, this implies that d is bigger than equal to 3 huh, for ns comp compatibility. OK, so it means that you need, this means that in dimension two, we can certainly say things about self compressive, you know, st stabilization of self-similar solution to Euler uh, in this sense. But we know that in dimension two, if we take such profile, we feed them to the corresponding machinery, the parameter B will not be small. It will tend to grow. So it's, uh, it means that the, the viscous term, as you expect, at least for these profiles, had this profile, has a destabilizing effect on, on singularity formation. But in dimension three, there is a range. It doesn't work for all nonlinearity, but it gives you a window of nonlinearities for which you can hope to do that. 
okay? which is exactly the way uh, 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 things have been. Okay? So it gives you a window where you can uh, pretend, or you can hope at least, that uh, uh, the viscous term or the additional the quantum pressure there is lower order. OK, so, so this is the picture. And what I said, I said the other time, this is how we finish this. And this is what I want to make maybe a little bit more clear to, 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 to today. And this is something that has been seen on other problems. You have to be careful. So in fact, there are tons of, you know, this unique trajectory, it's certainly going to go through P2, but then something funny happens at P2, and I'm going to recall this uh, maybe later. Uh, uh, so there is, in particular, so there is a, a, a generic limited regularity at P2. Another way of saying that is that I could very well construct a solution to my ODE in the following way. I take the unique curve that enters here. I take any curve that comes here. There are tons of them. And I claim that the corresponding sol solution that I constructed this way has some regularity. I can make this regularity as high, as high as I want, interestingly enough, by playing with my parameter R. But I will never be smooth because, in fact, there is a unique there's only one solution that passes in a C infinity way through P2. I'm going to recall you, you this. And there is no reason why it should be this one, unless I choose R in a very careful way. OK? So, and I want to explain, I want to, you know, briefly why this is an issue. And, and, and uh, uh, so, but this is something to, to be kept in mind. OK, so I want to, before motivating that, so I want to pretend that I don't have this problem. And I want to jump to point three. I want to tell you about the stability problem. Okay, which in particular is, is, is of, of, of course, it's connected to the question. Uh, uh, so I have, of course, a linear problem. So I need to look at the linear flow. And I need a machinery to close nonlinear estimates. OK, so let me may, maybe just, um, uh, so just in order to write things that, that are correct. So what you can do. So the first thing you, you want to do, maybe let me let let me write. So what, what's the strategy? It's very clear. So this is my equation. Uh, the first thing you want to do is you want to linearize your flow close to uh, uh, your self-similar profile, which is nothing but a stationary solution of this. You want to say, I have a linearized operator, and you want to study what this linearized operator does. And of course, the, the way you want to do it, at first, again, uh, when I look at the stability problem, of course, the first thing you do is, again, you, you stick to b equals 0. And then, of course, we will need at some point to remember that b is non-zero, OK? And, and uh, I'll say a word uh, about this. But roughly, the, the, the main part of the analysis is really to do b equals 0 and understand the linearized flow close to one uh, uh, of this profile. OK, so typically, let's just take a, a second uh, 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 to see uh, the kind of thing that, that, that we have. So you, you, you can linearize the equation. So you will just expand rho. You will uh, change it for rho profile plus correction. So maybe I'm going to call the, uh, the correction rho as well. I mean, uh, what I'm doing is clear. I'm just expanding. Uh, so this is psi profile plus correction. So maybe I should make, may, 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 maybe this is rho total, like uh, a t like total. OK, so this is the full nonlinear solution of this problem. It would be for rho t and psi t. And I just expand I rho as rho p psi p, where rho p psi p is my self-similar solution, OK? I expand. And as a matter of fact, if I want to be precise, just for technical reason, I don't like to work with psi. I prefer to work with what I will call phi. But it's really the same thing. So phi is rho p psi. OK, it's just, uh, I'm just shifting because it's, it's more convenient in the, in the analysis. OK, so you just. Send it in, you shake it out, you use the fact that, of course, rho p psi p is a stationary solution to your problem, and you, you, you will get a, an equation for, for the profile. So the typical thing that you get is something like that. So you get d tau rho. 
is equal to, so let's just take a second to write this down. So I have h1 rho minus h2 lambda rho minus Laplace plus h3 phi plus g rho. So this is the first equation. And I have d tau phi is equal to minus p minus 1 q rho minus h2 lambda phi plus I have something like h1 minus e phi uh, plus g phi. Okay, so let's see what did I introduce here. The, I, I just introduced some, some notation just to give you a feeling of, oh, I'm sorry, of what's going on here. So g rho and g phi these are just my nonlinear terms. Okay, so these are my nonlinear terms. They are whatever they need to be. Okay, so they are the formally the corrections. Any sort of quadratic terms that you created there has been put there, it's thrown to the garbage. Again, I took b equals zero. Okay, so b squared Laplace uh, is not in this picture, and I need to tell you what h1. And this is where things start being interesting. So I need to tell you. So what, what do I mean by? So I introduce this function h1 h2 and h3 and q. So this is just algebra. So um, actually, I can write down what it is. So h1 is just something like this. So it's minus Laplace psi p plus mu l r minus 1 over 2. So this is, uh, this is the first guy. So this is h1. h2. I prefer to think of it this, this, so it's also equal actually. So I can maybe it's more maybe it's more clever. So it's more clever to write this down in terms of the end and tra transform. So these are guys that are given to me by my profile. So they typically so the typical kind of formula you have is this: you have mu l over two, one minus omega times one plus sigma prime sigma. Okay. Uh, so my profile rho p psi p is equivalent to having this trajectory. Maybe I can put a p here. Uh, just after transformation, just omega p, sigma p. Okay, so every time you, it's the same thing. I, it's just a change of variable from here to here for the, for the stationary solution. So h1 is equal to this. h2 is equal to mu times one minus omega. And h3 is something, do I have h3? Yeah, h3 is Laplace of rho p divided by rho p, and finally, maybe the most important quantity is q. q is rho to the p minus 1. OK, so what do I mean by that? I simply mean that you see a linearized operator, and of course, the coefficients h1, h2, h3, etc., et q here, they depend on your profile. OK, it's the standard thing you should expect. You linearize. And of course, you linearize a quasi-linear wave equation, so you see this guy, you know, you see these this profiles appear with, you know, they really modify the highest number of derivatives uh, in, in, in your equation. Okay, so they depend, they depend. So this structure depends, depends on the profile uh, 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 rho p psi p. Okay, let me say, however, let me say again that uh, uh, the fact that, so here this is the origin in space, so I have a smooth solution, and then eventually here, let me remind you that this is decay here. Okay, so if you want in space, asymptotically, of course, uh, 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 I have some, I mean, some of these coefficients disappear, I can understand what happens as z goes to infinity. So I have sort of a limit structure, if you want, of my operator as z goes to, to plus infinity. So there's one difficulty that we will have to face. One uh, difficulty uh, which we will have to face is that there is no formula. There is no formula for the profile. OK, so it simply means, you see, actually, it's very inter interesting. On this phase portrait, sometimes you have formula. There are the celebrated you know, set of explicit solutions. So sometimes, in some regime of parameters, 
some of this, so not this one, but some other trajectories may come with formula. There are hidden first integrals and these kind of things, but it's not the case here. At least not that I'm aware of. So one of the difficulties that we have to face is that really the way we understand the profile is just a curve on the face portrait. Okay, so now you ask me, uh, is this quantity positive? Is this quantity bigger than the square of this other one? I mean, what's, what's going on? On Well, it's, you know, you need to go dig for it. Nothing is given to you. Okay, maybe it's very simple. Maybe you're lucky. Maybe it's not. Of course, there is structure in this space portrait. You understand that, you know, it's not anything. But you have to be careful. This is the picture of omega in terms of sigma. If you write omega as a function of x and sigma as a function of x, you will see that this guy is far from being monotonic, right? It's uh, it's an unpleasant. This is an unfriendly guy. Okay, so this is one of the difficulties that we will have to face. We don't have any formula. Okay, so to, this is the the first thing. So, okay. so now I need to explain, so how do you deal with something li like this? So maybe uh, um, there is something completely elementary. So I promise not to erase this. So these are my questions. I'm going to keep this. So one simple observation, of course, so I, I actually, you know, already here, you know, depending on, on, on who is doing the analysis, people may have different point of view on these kind of things. Typically, specialists of fluid mechanics that tell you I have compressible Euler, say I'm in the radially symmetric case, they will tell you, well, I'm going to use my Riemann invariance and make my Riemann invariance evolve, and this is how things can be written if you want to. But uh, 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 however, there, there is one thing that is very clear from here, and it's, it's completely uh, uh, standard in, uh, in, in compressible fluid dynamics. Have, of course, this thing, I mean, in some sense, I don't need this machinery of Riemann invariant, which is very radial. I can simply say, of course, what I'm facing here, uh, we're just facing a wave equation, right? This is just a wave equation. And maybe the simplest way of seeing this, you see what you do is you take d tau of the second equation. You compute d tau square phi. Okay, so you have a bunch of cross terms which are going to come here, okay? And of course, then you're going to hit d tau rho. d tau rho, you're going to compute from the above, but it's going to ask you for rho, but rho, you compute it here, okay? So you will have an equation. So at the end of the day, you get something like this. Uh, you get d t square phi, and this is how I'm going to think about this. So I get exactly this. I get p minus 1 q Laplace phi minus h2 squared lambda squared phi minus twice h2 lambda d tau phi plus a1 lambda phi plus a2 d tau phi plus a3 phi equals plus nonlinear terms in rho phi. This is my equation. Okay? This is what I have to study. And you understand that, of course, uh, uh, a1, a2, a3, again, they are computed from h1, h2, h3. So they depend on the profile. They depend on the profile. OK, and you understand immediately what you're facing here. So let me remind you. So lambda is ZdZ. So Z is the radial. Uh, lambda is ZdZ. Uh, so what I'm facing here, of course, the, the principal part of my operator. So it's, it's, it's very clear. So I have, the, I have two derivatives here in space, but I have two derivatives there as well. OK, so and in particular, when I count uh, the number, you know, uh, if I look at this thing, p minus 1 Laplace, p minus 1 Laplace uh, minus h2 squared lambda squared, of course, the highest number of derivative is, I'm sorry, there is a q here. The highest number of derivative is pi p minus 1 q uh, minus h2 squared, dz squared plus blah, blah. Okay, so of course, you should expect you have to be careful. Probably this may vanish, and this will vanish. And of course, this, this degenerates. It vanishes at P2. 
Okay, so it's meant, of course, your, in some sense, your, your ODE degenerates there. Well, of course, your PDE, your linearized operator, has an issue there. Of course, it vanishes at speed two. It's meant to, it's meant to be. But of course, you understand that you do not have only, uh, uh, of course, derivative in space. It's absolutely fundamental. You have, you have tons of terms here. You have, of course, mixed, this is mixed space time de de derivative. So this is mixed d tau dz. Uh, and you have first order terms, and you have a zero order term. So this is order one, this is order one, and this is order zero. Okay, and at this point, you can't really throw anything to, to the garbage, so you need to understand what's going on with this guy. So I think this is incomprehensi incomprehens incomprehensible if you don't uh, uh, make a connection with what people have done uh, uh, on singularity formation problems before. Okay, so let me explain uh, 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 just conceptually how do you address these kind of questions on much simpler problems. Okay, so how do we, how do we, you know, uh, what kind of estimates, uh, 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 what kind of, uh, 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 what uh, kind of estimates should we expect? Okay, and let me try to, to again, just give you uh, an, uh, uh, um, an answer in the completely elementary case. So let me go back to uh, 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 just something elementary now, the nonlinear heat equation. Because I need to explain uh, uh, conceptually what's going on here, because otherwise it's just an abstract box and, and this yes. will not change the sign, however, right? I mean, it might vanish at B2, but... Uh, oh, yes, yeah. it will. It can even change the sign, you say? Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes, of course. So yes. you have a mixed problem. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's a very unfriendly guy. Okay? But, and, and I, uh, you know, I, let me put it this way. I think we would all have dropped the pen seeing this monster, but so many people worked ahead of us that you know, there's a whole... You know, there's really a connection with tons of things that have been done before and which, you know, uh, allowed us to find a way to, to, to deal with this, okay? But this is very unfriendly. There is no doubt that there is something, uh, 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 but again, you know, very uh, clever things were done ahead of us and this is going to give us the intuition of what sh should, should be done here. So let me go back to a completely trivial problem. So I just look at, again, DTU is Laplace U plus I can put U modulus of U to the P minus one. Okay, so this is my root equation. I want to study singularity formation for this, and then I just do my dynamical change of variable as we've done several times. So I just say, I zoom. I have one over lambda of t to the two over p minus one. I do v of tau and y. y is x over lambda of t. Uh, ds dt is, I'm sorry, d tau dt is one over lambda squared. And I declare that here in this case, I can decide that lambda is the square root. Okay, so I renormalize self-similarly, and I know what I get. I get another equation, which is what I call the, the renormalized flow. So it's d tau v is Laplace v minus a half, two over p minus one plus lambda v, plus v v to the p minus one, where again, lambda is y that grad, or call it z dz, whatever you want. Okay, so it's just exactly the same flow with this new term. That's, that's the new guy. That's the new guy. So, what, so the question is, what kind of estimates can you expect? So imagine either that you want to estimate things here, or imagine that you are linearized, you are linearizing close to a given stationary solution of this equation, and you ask yourself what kind of estimate uh, uh, you can get of on your flow. So of course there are two things you, I can erase. There are two things you can do. So maybe let me let me make a point here. The, it's always the same story. So if this is u, this is x, this is u, this is u of t and x. So I imagine that u is concentrating, right? And I map this. I zoomed on the region here. I zoomed here on the window, and so because I define y to be x over the square root, 
And now I imagine that my profile in Y, maybe I have to think that it looks like a, a, a given self-similar profile, which is given to me plus correction. OK, but so you have to think that uh, estimating Y in a large region uh, just means that y can, x can be small and y is still very large. Okay? So ex estimating so solutions after renormalization, of course, simply means that I'm looking at things in my concentrating window here. Okay? So, 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 so this is what needs to be, uh, uh, to be fixed. So there are two kinds of estimates. Uh, there are two kinds of estimates I, I can do here. So first kind of estimate. So estimate one. Well, think, think of it this way. Imagine that the equation that you have here, you know, you can, I mean, if you linearize, you can even think of the linear problem if you, if you want to. I can do something com, 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 completely stupid. So there is something I can certainly do. I can estimate a global sub norm. Right? So I will simply say the following words. I will say that if I compute in RD uh, the gradient, I don't know, to some power, uh, 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 S of u square ds. Well, so this is just going to be something like, so I just unfold my change of variable. So may maybe so I'm going to have 1 over lambda to the s. I'm going to have lambda to the 2 over p minus 1. I have grad s of what I call v square. And of course, this is dx. So, sorry. So I've set y is x over lambda. So I have lambda to the d dy. Right? So I have something like, so this is lambda, so maybe I should put it like this. It's 1 over lambda to the 2s minus what I call s critical. And of course, s critical is the d over 2 minus 2 over p minus 1 times my Sobolev norm times my Sobolev norm square dy. OK, so what does it mean? It means that imagine that you just get rid of this thing, and you just look at this linear operator here. And what I'm telling you is that when I compute, so maybe on this picture here, what, what I'm telling you here is the following thing. I'm telling you if I compute the global Sobolev norm of my v in y, dy, then this is equal to nothing but lambda to the twice s minus sc, the Sobolev norm of my root problem in u. So this is radius of u squared dx. OK, and then you have to remember, I did a change of variable. Lambda lambda is uh, the square root of t minus t, which means that when I go to tau time, in fact, I'm, ex I'm equal to e to the minus tau. OK, so what does it mean? It means that if I look at this linear problem, I get rid of that, then I can compute exactly the evolution of, so of, so of Sobolev norm. Norm above scaling will decay exponentially. Norms below may have a problem because, of course, for the linear problem, this is concerned. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that this guy is your friend, right? This is, this is your best friend. This new operator here is the guy. Simply, it's an artifact of renormalization. It's the machine that can allow you to indeed get decay, but of course, you need to take sufficiently many derivatives, right? So it depends on the scaling of your problem. It depends on the renormalization that you did. It's already written here. Okay, so if you want to get, so it's it's the natural functional setting to derive decay in time, and exponential, ec exponential decay is simply to uh, uh, compute sufficiently many derivatives of the equation. But you understand, of and of course, the nice thing with this is that it's, it's a global norm. In some sense, it has nothing to do with this picture here. It's, it's really something global. It's just a change of vibe. So this has nothing to do, you are saying, with the coercivity of the top or the second order. No, this is uh, Laplace uh, minus a half. So, so, so what, what I'm saying is that if I have this operator, if I compute Sobolev norm, well, it's it, 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 it depends what you mean. I mean, it's, this thing is whatever it is. But wh all, all, all I'm saying is that if I compute Sobolev norms on this operator, I'm going to find, you know, I'm going to find this. I mean, this identity is completely trivial because I know, you know, the way you, I, I think of it, that you know that you're coming from a problem above, right? So it's just an artifact. This, this, this thing here is just an artifact of my change of variable. If I have the wave equation, if I put a t square here, I can play that exactly the same game. I'm renormalizing, but I know that above my Sobolev norm are, are conserved. 
So if I write down whatever, I'll, I'll do this in a second, but if I write down whatever analog of this problem is, it's automatic that the linear part, you know, whatever this will produce, and it's going to produce something like this, wh whatever it produces, you know, it, it's, it, it comes with this idea that if I compute high enough sub OLF norms, I will get decay. Okay, so, 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 so this observation is completely universal, it has nothing to do with the heat equation. It's a, it's a very simple, uh, so maybe I'll erase it, I'll, I'll, I'll redraw this later. Okay, so, so the, this is a universal machine. To, I mean, this is a way to think that this kind. It's like the sign there, it doesn't matter. The sign that you That's why the sign, it, this, is, it, this is what you mean, exactly. Whatever structure this thing has, is compatible with this computation because it's an artifact of my change of vibe. But it's only two for five million. You need to take sufficiently many of them. You need to beat scaling, right? Because this is it's written exactly here. Okay, uh, low sub OLF norm tend to grow. It's the other around. If you uh, because indeed something is being cre created. Okay, so you need to learn how to. You need to, you know, the, from scratch. You need to understand that uh, you have high. Uh, uh, you need to to have high enough derivatives here. Uh, but of course, this is this is the first way. This is this is something completely universal. This can be used for NLS for the for the wave. I'm going to get back to to this. But there's a second way. There's a second way to get estimates, which is absolutely not this. Which is you know this is just an artifact of renormalization. I'm just mapping things back to my root problem. But there's another way, and uh, 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 this is something you learn from Giga Cohen. What, what they observed, it's, it's, it's a beautiful observation, of course, what they observed, so this is my renormalized equation. So actually, they did it at the nonlinear level, but you can also, of course, do it at the linear level if you want to. So when I look at this equation, there is another set of estimates which has nothing to do with the root problem. You know, it has nothing to do with what's happening here. It's something else. It has to do, so in the giga cone, the basic observation is that, of course, the operator Laplace minus the Fokker Planck, one half y dot grad, can be realized. This is nothing but one over rho divergence of rho gradient. Okay, where rho is e to the minus y squared over two. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that there is a natural energy identity. So maybe. Right. So the in, in particular, it means that you, if you hit the equation with d tau, you integrate by parts and you will find something. And of course you integrate, but you put the measure rho dy. Right? You integrate with this measure. Okay? Then what you will get is something li like this. You will get something like this. You will get that some quantity, so you have something like this. You have d d tau, you have the integral of r d. So you have grad d squared rho uh, dy. Uh, typically, we have a term like, so uh, I suppose it's uh, uh, maybe, so you will have a term like minus 1 over p plus 1. This is your nonlinear term, d to the p plus 1 rho dy. And then I st I'm still left with this term here, which I suppose will come with a plus and maybe a half. So I have a half p minus 1. So maybe there is no half, actually. Uh, yeah, I think it's like there or something like this anyway. So I'm going to have v squared rho dy. And of course, this is going to come with, I hit everything with d tau, so I'm going to have minus the integral of rd. So I have d tau v squared rho dy. Okay, and remember rho, rho is e to the minus y squared over 2. Something like this. Okay, so think of it this way. This has nothing to do with the original equation, this is a machine. So of course, this is written at the nonlinear level. But of course, if I was to, I could, I, so this is how Giga couldn't use it. But let me just make the following point. Of course, I could write this at the linear level. And my hope would be to control norms like this, right? It's, it's typically, right, you want to control norms like the integral of Rd of v squared e to the minus y squared over 2 dy. It's exactly the kind of quantity you would like to put your hands on. Okay, so what does this quantity mean? It means that this is, you, you see this exponential weight, 
of course, localizes, right? It's a very strong, uh, it's, it's, it means that you control, you control the flow locally in space on the singularity. Okay, so it's really something you should think, uh, maybe I control my flow from 0 to 100. Something like this, okay? So I can hope to have control in time, decay in time of this kind of norm, okay? This is typically uh, what I can hope for. And then once I had this first kind, and, and this estimate has nothing to do with the global subolith, it's something different. So now if you look at the analysis that you can- How Does it connect to the derivative, the project? Uh, you get a better estimate if you take many derivatives. Well, it does not. That, that you, you, this is, this it is, must be connected. This is, well, okay, so you have an excellent point. So let me put it this way. So this is very interesting. So this is where there's a bifurcation from the parabolic world and the, and the literature, and then what's been done later with, you know, we, you will not see subolef norms and this kind of thing. This is not the way pe people think about this. People think about this typically in the, in the parabolic literature by saying, when well, I have control of the solution on the singularity, and I want to propagate an infinity estimate. Right, which I typically use, do using some, you know, maximal principle or this kind of thing. This is typically the kind of way, uh, because of course I cannot, you see, a norm like this, it's not because you control something like this that you control your solution, because of course it localizes very strongly on the singularity. Maybe something wants to get wild, maybe something wants to grow. So a norm like this alone cannot control everything. It's just part of the story. Okay, so this is exactly the point. So how it's done in the literature depends on the problem and depends on, but you know, this kind of identity plays, a, the control of this kind of norm plays a fundamental role, but my claim is that then you need to couple this with something else. And you can think that one completely universal way that will apply to anything is to boot this kind of control with this kind of subref, which is exactly what we're going to do. You put these two together, you shake it out, and you're gonna get what you want, okay? So it's a mix between really local control on the singularity and something that simply sees scaling. You want to propagate whatever you have. This is exactly how we're going to do things. We're going to get estimates here, and then we're going to propagate them, okay, using this kind of subleth thing. Okay, and then we're going to ask our operator uh, to, 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 to do that. So as far as making estimates is concerned, you see the beauty of this kind of, 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 of thing. So imagine that, imagine that you took your equation here, and imagine that you decide to linearize your equation close to, uh, Im imagine that you have just to make things clear here. Imagine that you linearize exactly like I'm doing here. Imagine that I tell you that I have a profile, I don't know, VP, which is a solution to the stationary problem, a self-similar solution. Let's write that grad VP plus VP, VP to the P minus one is equal to zero. And imagine that, uh, yet, in, imagine that you say that V is VP plus a correction, I don't know, let's call it omega. Then what's the omega equation going to be? It's going to be theta omega is linearized omega plus nonlinear omega. And what is going to be li linearized omega? It's going to be exactly this one over rho divergence of rho grad omega. And then I have, I'm going to have a nonlinear term here. I'm going to have something like plus uh, my profile, so how did I call it, VP? So I'm going to have VP to the P minus one omega. Okay, this will be uh, 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 my linearized operator when I linearize here, okay? And I have a bunch of non-linear terms. And so the observation now uh, is the following, what's the impact? So in some sense, this, you know where, where it does, it's completely self-adjoint and you know where it does. But of course, this thing, you can ask yourself, what's the impact of this thing? And here the key is that this decays. This decays in space. So in fact, you can think of this, this is like a compact perturbation of this thing. Meaning what? The only thing this guy can, can do is create eigenvalues. Okay, so how many it creates, it depends. But essentially, spectrally speaking, this is, you know, this is just a machine to create eigenvalues. This is a machine to create positivity. So a modulo of finite number of eigenvalues, because I decay, this thing is gonna get me exponential decay in time. I'm gonna have a spectral gap. I, thanks to uh, this kind of, of, of identity there. So I have very good control of my solution in the inner zone. 
And if I want to close, and of course, because it's very localized, I cannot close my nonlinear term from, from E to Z, but then I can couple these estimates with maybe some sub OLF norms, or if you're doing parabolic things, maybe with you know, softer maximal principle type of estimates uh, to actually control my flow for, 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 forever. Okay? But this is really the, the principle. All in the case of the heat equation, all the, the, what the profile can create is nothing but eigenvalues to a problem which essentially is completely explicit. And of course, the beauty of this is that, in fact, it's not really spectral analysis. You can do everything by hands. It's all about energy estimates. You can understand everything in terms of energy estimates. And this makes this analysis so nice. In particular, it's been propagated to more complicated problems where maybe your potential depend on time, type 2 problem, etc. because this is just for the heat equation uh, energy estimate, if you want. You do not need any sort of abstract spectral uh, machine. OK, so this is, this is the heat equation, right? So of course, uh, let me say two things. If you do an NLS equation, if you do a Schrodinger equation, well, it's a different world. Right, so it's really, it's really different. You know, put me an I, you know, if you put an I here, your self adjointness etc., disappears immediately. It's a different universe. It's not a small problem, it's a huge problem. And there are many different groups that have developed various techniques to go around this difficulty. None of them is simple, and in some sense, I don't think we still have a fair global picture of what we should or should not do. It's certainly made tons of progress, but there are a few things missing there. But now we don't have uh, a thing, uh, so this is the good thing of going to uh, uh, these variables here, we don't have a Schrodinger equation anymore, we have a wave equation. Okay, so we have a wave equation. And for the wave equation, so, so there is a point here. So now I'm, I'm looking at this, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm looking at the wave equation. So, and, and, I, and I want to try to get estimates, so I want to, get, I want to derive estimates uh, 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 for my wave equation. So maybe I should, I think I've written this somewhere here. Just to make my algebra right here. So this is, this is, okay. So you can, if you want, you can, uh, uh, so, so of course there, there, there are two kinds of things you can do. The first kind of thing you can do is you can say, well, for my wave equation, of course, if I, you know, let's just, let me say the following words. Let me mean, because there is going to be a huge difference. So let me take the true wave equation. Let me say that I started from dt square u is Laplace u plus u, u to the p minus 1. OK? Uh, really this one, not this one. Let's mean that I really started from there. Let's do your renormalization. You renormalize exactly like you would do for the heat equation. And then you would get an equation for uh, 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 the renormalized flow Get about the sign then or not? The plus here? Yeah, so it, it should be the focusing one. Yeah, so it is, right? But, but it's, it's, you know, and I, what I care for is the structure of the linearized operator. So if you want to, you can, you can, you can, re, re, can remove this here. It's, it's not the problem. I'm, I'm just trying to say, if I renormalize this linear operator, what kind of things do I get? OK, I'm going to get something that looks like this. But not quite. Okay, so let's just do this computation. So this is something uh, you will find. This is how. Uh, so there's this uh, paper by Antonini and Merle back um, uh, at the beginning of 2000, and of course there is this uh, amazing series of work by Merle and Dag, which is all about this. So the first thing they do, they renormalize, and they tell you what the renormalized equation should look like. And the way they write it down is exactly like a wave equation. So I'm going to do the same thing. So they tell you they have something like this. So their variable is omega. So they have some, something like this. They have L of omega minus twice p plus 1 over p minus 1 squared omega. And they have plus omega, omega to the p minus 1. And then there are a bunch of linear terms. So they have something like this. So they have minus p plus 3 over p minus 1 theta omega. And then they have minus twice. So the renormalized variable is y. So they have dy squared. And this is d tau 
uh, omega, okay? And actually L is exactly, so you should think of it, so I'm gonna write L in a different way uh, in a second, but you should think of the following L, if I think of the way it's written here, you should think it's exactly this. It's one minus y squared dy squared omega plus a1 dy. So this is L of omega. Okay, and a1 can be co computed, etc. And uh, I'm just re recalling this is a one-dimensional computation. You can do this computation in a more general case, but this is what I want to see so far. Okay, so what's going on here? It's just, uh, this is just algebra. I just renormalize with the scaling of the equation and I get an operator, which is exactly like this one over, over here in the following sense. You see the highest number of derivative in space is this guy. Okay, so, uh, uh, so it's two derivative, but it degenerates when y is equal to two, 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 one. And then I have a bunch of cross terms. So I have two, I have two derivatives. I have other two, two derivative terms, so they have cross term in y and tau, and I have other, maybe order one, uh, 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 order zero, and order one operator. So it has exactly the same structure like what I have uh, over there. And of course, you know exactly in the case of the wave equation, you know exactly what's going on here. What's going on is that uh, uh, so my renormalization, so the way it works, typically I would say that u is one over lambda, so this would be, I suppose, one over p minus one omega of tau and y, and y is x over lambda, something like this. So you know exactly, and lambda in the case of the wave equation, of course, lambda is just going to be t minus t. There is no square root because it's the wave, it's the scaling of time that changes. So what does it mean? It means that y equal one, which is where my uh, operator after renormalization degenerates is nothing but the light code, right? It's just, this is just x is t minus t. Okay, so if I draw, uh, you know, I can draw my light code here, because this is x, this is time, and um, actually it's the other way around, so uh, well, I can put time, I could put big t here, I'm just drawing a backward light cone from the expected singularity. And what I'm saying is that I see my operator in some sense that degenerates when I am on, on the light cone, that is when x is t minus t. Okay, so in, in, you, would, you should think of it in the following way. You should think that this is exactly like this. There is one big difference here the function q, it's written here. Uh, maybe so, so because this is like y squared, so it's like the function q is constant. So in this case, it's like I'm having exactly this, except that q is constant. Okay. In my case, q is going to depend on time because it's created by my, by my profile. It's going to depend on space. I'm, I'm sorry, it has a shape. And this changes everything. Okay, so you should think that in the case of the semi-linear wave equation, that I have exactly this function here, and, and, and then you, know, the, you have an algebra that is specific to this function here. What I'm trying to say is that when I linearize close to my profile, I don't have one minus y squared. I have something more complicated. And the fact that this function is not exactly this one, and actually what, what this function does is going to be essential for, for the analysis. Okay, so let me explain. Yeah. Effect of the quasi-linearity. Absolutely, totally an effect of the quasi-linearity of the equation. The fact that I have something that comes in in front of the second order derivative that depends on the profile, it's a quasi-linear effect. It never happens if you have a, a semi-linear problem. So actually the cancellation, uh, the, the, that term there, uh, yes. is zero exactly on the corresponding light cone. Exactly, that's the light cone. Okay. This, this is exactly how we think about it. We call it the, the light cone. So it's, it's, I suppose, you know, if you were to do, it's more the sound cone, right? This, is, this should be more, uh, more appropriate. This is, but of course, we have a sound cone, but of course, remember, we linearize close to a given profile. Okay, so we know to leading order what our sound cone is supposed to be, right? Because typically it depends on the solution itself, but I'm trying to bootstrap that I will stay close to a given one. Okay, so this is why, in some sense, at least to leading order, it's given to me. Okay, but what I'm saying is that if I do this for the semi-linear problem, I have a similar structure. I have this degeneracy of, uh, of derivatives, but the algebra of this function is very special. I can immediately say, why is the algebra of this function 
uh, very special. It's very clear. Simply because, so I can, you know, this is exactly the point. For this problem, if you, you know, so now you know, I have this equation, and you ask me to estimate, remove the nonlinear term, just look at the linear operator. You're trying to understand what the linear operator does. And you ask me to estimate for you. Well, if it's really this equation, if it's this operator, that I know that it comes from the wave equation above. Okay? So it means that I have control of Sobolev norm for you above, which I can translate exactly like here into decay of Sobolev norm for the operator here. Okay, so at the linear level, if I have exactly uh, 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 this equation, and I, 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 I remove the nonlinear term, of course, if I take sufficiently many derivatives, I will find that I have exponential decay of this kind of norm. Okay, you have to be a little bit careful. There is something unpleasant from scratch. When I talk about Sobolev norms, maybe I should do this here. You know, there will be something funny. It's always the same structure. You have to be a little bit careful here. There's something unpleasant with the wave equation, which you need to understand. You know, uh, a typical Sobolev norm, for example, energy is dt u plus grad u squared. OK, so, so this is over Rd, and this is in space. So of course, space scales well, but dt doesn't like it. It's going to give you norms, very funny identities. Like you're going to have something like d tau plus uh, lambda z, or lambda y. Uh, maybe this is I renormalize so I call it omega plus etc. Right? So you have to be very careful. Uh, this is where you understand that some degeneracy can happen. You have a uh, what dt in original variable transform to after renormalization is something funny, and this is a difficulty that uh, of course does not show up for the heat equation. So you have to be a bit uh, a bit ca ca careful. Okay. So my claim is so my claim is the following. So if I, if I have a semi-linear wave equation, then this is the structure I have. And if it's the semilinear equation, there is a way to get, you know, if you want to stabilize a self-similar solution or run this kind of program for this kind of equation, this is something you can do essentially using only Sobolev norm. This is something that my student uh, Ryan Kim did very nicely. So there is really a machinery that, you know, just is something like this, which you can uh, run. Okay, so, th so this is the, the first thing. The second thing is that what we learn from uh, this is something that started with Antonini and Merle and then is used systematically uh, uh, in the Merzak series of papers. Well, so what Atem and Frank did is that they said, but for the, for there is a similar, there is something similar to the gigacon functional. There is a way to get estimates, and what you will find in the paper is exactly the following thing, where they tell you that they can realize. They simply said, well, this operator L, which sees the highest number of derivative in space and maybe the first order term, we can think of it as being one over rho. So uh, this is a 1D computation. This can be j. I'm just writing the 1D one. So they tell you that is, this is 1 minus y squared dy omega. OK, so you have some sort of so rho is, it's not a Gaussian weight anymore. It's 1 minus y squared to the 2 over p minus 1. So maybe this is 1d. So I'm just going to write y. Okay, So rho is a given weight. And of course, when you have things like this, then you get a natural uh, 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 energy identity, which uh, you're, you're going to have the following thing. So you have d, d tau over quantity. So typically look like this. So this is the integral in the cone. So for y less than 1, so you have 1 half d tau omega squared plus 1 half 1 minus y squared dy omega squared. And then you have plus p plus 1 over p minus 1 squared. You have omega squared minus 1 over p plus 1 omega to the p plus 1. This is equal to minus blah, blah, blah. So minus, so I have algebra. Let's ignore constants, but I have something I have. I have ds y squared, I have ds d tau. I'm sorry, this is d tau. Uh, d tau, d tau, this is d tau squared. And I have this weight divided by 1 minus y squared, and the whole thing is dy. OK, so in your favorite language, Sergio, is just, uh, this is just the vector field against the suitable vector field. And you do whatever you have to do, and you get that some identity gives you a sign. OK, something is pushing for you. OK, so what's going on here? Uh, there, is, there are two things that are, that are going on here. Of course, you recognize something similar to the gigacon. In some sense, the structure uh, is similar. Of course, I should put weights. There are weights. Uh, this whole thing, the, the space, 
Yeah, there is, yeah. there is a raw DY. Everything is raw DY, right? Because otherwise you are completely dead. OK, so what's going on here? This is a control. This, can, you know, this is a machinery to get control of the solution in the cone. OK, so this is really inside. Do you get some boundary terms at the uh, observer? Y? So because the weight, this is an excellent point, the weight is 1 minus y squared. It cancels, so there is no boundary point. So there is no boundary term for this computation. Of course, you could produce a more general com computation with boundary terms if you wanted to. So, uh, but this is the algebra, and you see there is a point here, so which is exactly the key point. So this is the one-dimensional com computation, and this row comes with an exponent here. Okay, which of course has to do with the scaling of the equation. So if I was to do this, this computation, in the general case, if you give me a general nonlinear wave equation, you will normalize and you try to do this. What you will discover is that this exponent here, you should really think that this exponent here, it's an alpha of d and p. And of course, it depends on scaling. As a matter of fact, in the setting where they were, the alpha was positive or the, 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 because it's a subcritical, it's a conformal subcritical case. But there may very well be cases where this alpha is negative. This is when Franck and Carlos studied the energy critical wave equation, this was exactly the situation. Alpha was negative. So alpha is, dis is dictated by the scaling of the equation. Right? And of course, you have to understand, this is exactly as you said, Sergio. If alpha is negative, look at this term here. I have rho divided by 1 minus y squared. So if alpha is negative, I will pick up boundary terms. Or another way of saying this, uh, I cannot do this integration by parts in the sense that generically this is singular on the code. There is no reason why I should be able to integrate by parts. Okay, so you give me a wave equation, you renormalize it, and you ask yourself, can I produce this kind of identities? The answer will depend on where the scaling lies. Okay? And of course, I should say that th th this, is, this is just one identity. There are tons of identities. But this question of what kind of control does it give us? How do we control the solution in the cone? And how the degeneracy that shows up here on the cone enter the analysis? It's the heart of the Merzag analysis and on everything they tell you about what solution uh, uh, should be looking like. So it also works for high dimensions or is so? So certainly in the, uh, so you have to, so then you, you know, you have to talk to Frank and Atem, but think of it, there, there are two kinds of things they do. They, produce examples of this and this kind of solutions, which is something very general. But they also give you classification results on what should happen or not. Okay? And whether this can be propagated to higher dimension, etc. It depends on what kind of, of results you, you want to know. The strategy uh, uh, certainly works very well in, in, in the radial case. But now there are classification results, things like the only self-similar solution to this or this is only given by this or that. This kind of rigidity theorem is not known always. right? So there may be other things. Okay, so it depends. But the principle, I mean, the, the way I'm going to use this big picture, you know, I don't have a classification problem. I have a linear problem. So all I want to do is, is try to use these two ideas, Sobel F estimate, or maybe the, this kind of norm, to try and get estimates on my problem there. OK, so let's try to do that. So of course, the first thing we tried, you understand, is this. That's exactly this. The first thing you feel like trying, so now I want to go back to my problem. Okay, so I have exactly, I have exactly this. But the big difference is that now, I mean, I'm, I don't have exactly this weight, 1 minus y squared. I have this function here, which depends on z. So my normalized variable is z here. And of course, it has a shape. It's not exactly given to me by this. So the first thing you would like to do, the first may, maybe stupid idea, First idea is to try and run sub -left norms. All right, so you know what we're going to try to do. You're simply going to say, well, I mean, I'm going to try to propagate. I'm going to try to compute the variation. I want to compute something like, you know, I don't know. So maybe this is the integral of Rd. So I want to propagate something like d tau. So how did I call my variable? I call it phi. So maybe d tau phi. Maybe this is phi k. Uh, where I decide that phi k, I've commuted my flow with derivatives, uh, and, and maybe, you know, nabla of phi k squared, something like, like this. And I want to try to see what this thing is equal to. And what I expect, 
remember, for the wave equation, I know what the answer to, to this thing is. I know exactly what I, what I should expect. I should expect something like minus uh, uh, 2k minus sc times the same norm, times the, times the same thing. That is the integral of d tau phi k squared plus nabla phi k plus other terms. So what I mean is that exponential decay after renormalization is simply the fact that my differential equation is going to come like this. Okay, so this is just, so you should think, what does it mean? It means that if you let your equation, if you let derivatives go through, through your equation, you compute the principal part, you compute Sobolev norm on the principal part, and you will see a very good term arise for you. It's here to help you, which is the machine to get exponential decay. Okay, so you say, okay, fine, I'm going to do that. And you understand, if you do that for exactly the semilinear wave equation, you see, if you start commuting derivatives, derivatives will hit here. Right? But there is a miracle, because it's the function 1 minus y squared, you have cancellations, and etc. Of course, it has to be. It comes from the problem above. But this guy is your friend. If you do this on my problem here, you start commuting derivatives, then you will start seeing this guy in the picture. And this guy will not be friendly at all. What this guy is going to give you, I can tell you, we've done this computation ten, 10 times. What you're going to get is something like this. You're going to get, uh, maybe there are constants that, that depend on k, but you're going to get the quadratic form. You're going to get something like a coefficient uh, uh, d tau phi squared. You're going to get, uh, with a coefficient a1, you're going to get the cross term uh, d tau uh, d, uh, in dz phi k. And you're going to get a term like uh, uh, a3 um, dz phi k squared, right? You, you get a full qu quadratic form. Yeah? And, and, and of course, a1, a2, a3, they depend on my profile, right? They depend on this thing here. So remember, you have no formula on your profile. So now you start it. So you form the discriminant of this, and you start asking yourself, can it be that this thing is going to have the right sign? You look at what your profile looks like, and the answer is no. It certainly is not globally true. Okay? This is not going to work. I mean, this is if you just do the stupid thing that you would like to do uh, in the um, in the case of you know just the, the semi-linear wave equation. This is not going to work, right? It's because my profile Q. Right, it's because uh, of the presence of the Q profile. Does it mean that somehow you have to differentiate according to the geometry of the profile? Well, you tell me. Maybe. I, it's, 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 In other words, you shouldn't use a, the standard coordinates. Just use coordinates which are... Well, you know, which are, I'm not aware of. I'm not aware, you know... It's, I mean, this we do all the time in relativity. Yes, yes but uh, we do have some experts of general relativity in our group, too. They seem to have an idea of what uh, should be done there. Uh, well, I mean, I don't know. Uh, maybe changing variables could be, you know, at the end of the day. I, I don't know. I like the idea that there is a simple universal brute force way of doing things, because in some sense, it's a machine to do whatever you want, right? Now, is there... You know, interestingly enough, as I said, some expert of, of uh, you know, fluid mechanics tried to revisit this using Riemann invariance, a sort of more refined structure based specifically on the flow, which, you know, I don't think it changes fundamentally things, but it sort of saw some, some structure there if, if, if you want. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, I like the fact that there is a simple, you know, universal way to, to deal with things. It doesn't mean that maybe, you know, something finer, in particular, I, I, I will speak about eigenvalues uh, uh, later, maybe there's a way to be a little bit more uh, you know, sharp on, on what's going on there. Okay? But let's, let's say that you want to do something you know, in, 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 in brute force, if you do sub -F in brute force, that's going to send you to hell. Okay? That's, that is for sure. You can't just walk in the problem like this. It will not work. This is, first, this is the first thing. So the second thing you want to do so second uh, uh, strategy is to try and build, you know, try to control local norms in the code. Local norm in the code. And, and then try to, so try to adapt uh, uh, this kind of Merzag type of estimate. And then you know what you have to do. So if you want to do that, it's very clear. Remember, uh, I, I told you that if you want what we call the measure, that is if you want this row to vanish on the cone, for a given problem, it depends on scaling. Okay, so I'm certainly above 
energy critical, it's hopeless to think that you can control your flow there. So what you, the first thing you want to start doing is you let derivatives grow through, go through, through your equation. Okay, so you commute the flow, you commute with derivatives. Okay, so if you call phi k, which is Laplace k phi, you should think that you will get a wave equation for phi k, so you get d to square phi k, and of course you start commuting with derivative, and you, and you know what's going on. I mean, uh, uh, um, this term is your friend, is here to help. This is, the, this is the scaling term, and this guy is a mess. It's not very friendly. So you, you do whatever you have to do, and what you say is the following thing. You say the principal part of the operator, I can write it exactly uh, uh, with, with a measure, so maybe g depends on k, l g k uh, of phi k, and then I have all these other terms that are going to show up. You know, I have all, you know, plus, plus all other terms, so in particular I have cross terms. I have what I call the uh, uh, <coughs> twice h2 lambda dita phi k, etc. So I have a whole bunch of terms, and of course uh, everything that comes in here Come, all the coefficients come with k dependence, where k is the number of derivatives. Okay, but you, you can certainly do that. You can decide that you want, you know, you, you commute with derivatives and you try to realize your linearized operator with the, you know, the, 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 the degenerate part. You try to write it exactly uh, 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 as, a, as a measure, so actually more specifically, so what you can do. So this is going to work. Uh, there's a unique way to do that. And maybe I'm going to erase that. So what you find So what you find So let's see what time. Yeah, perfect. So what you find is that uh, you can realize so the typical kind of structure that you have is the following thing. So um, so you you will find that L <coughs> maybe this is G of K phi <coughs> maybe a phi k actually. Uh, it's going to be something like this. It's one of a g index k. So I have, of course, my radial measure z to the d minus 1. I have dz. And I have z to the d minus 1. I have d squared. I have my measure g in this k. And I have minus delta. And I have dz phi k. Okay, so this is, this is the typical kind of thing that I should get. So you should think that, so delta. Uh, delta is the, is the delta, uh, uh, it's my sonic line, omega minus y squared minus sigma squared. So you should think, if I didn't erase the male zag, right, it's, it's exactly what I'm seeing here, that is I have a measure, which in this case would be rho, but, the, but it's not only just the measure, it's also the fact that I have this extra degeneracy here, which is exactly the analog of this thing here, right? So, so this depends on my profile, and huh? de delta is really delta of the profile. So I'm going to have the exact same thing that uh, 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 delta degenerates at P2. OK? So there's a unique way. Again, uh, you commute your flow. You, you look at the highest number of, of, of derivatives. You try to compute the measure. And you will see that there is a unique, uh, there is a unique g of k. So you compute g of k. So wait, so you have separately yep. compute Yeah, exactly. I take derivatives. Okay. So now the question you should ask me, you know, think of it this way. If I do, I know, again, let's go back to the semilinear heat, uh, wa wave equation, right? If I do this computation, I know exactly what's going to happen. What is going to happen is that as I take derivative, I will shift the principal part of my operator. It's pushing for me. And if I take sufficiently many of them, I know that whatever exponent showed up here is going to become positive. Okay, so maybe I started, so, so typically, for example, Frank and Atten, they started with, you know, um, typically in 1D, you're never energy supercritical. So their alpha uh, always has the good sign if P is not too large. But if you start H1 critical, and if you try to control H1 norm, you're going to have the wrong sign. But if you take more derivatives, if you take shift it, you will have the right sign. Okay, so the question is the following. And I want, I want this to be positive. Because if it's not, this is what we said. Either I'm going to get boundary terms when I integrate by parts, or I'm going to ask my functions to vanish on the cone, and they have no reason to. Okay, so the function space gets completely di completely different here. 
Okay, so I'm asking this, I'm asking the following. You compute GK and you ask yourself, how many, that's the key question, how many derivatives do I need? Do I need to make sure that uh, at P2, which is the degenerate point, what I want, I want GK of Z as I arrive in P2, I want to be like Z minus Z2, which is the P2 point, to the power alpha, and I want alpha to be positive. So alpha depends on K, right? Which is the smallest K when I commute, which is the smallest K such that actually G vanishes on the light code? Because if it does not, it's a different world, okay? Well, okay, so you do your algebra and you understand that this, everything depends on your profile Q. Okay, so everything depends if I draw, uh, maybe I'm going to erase that. If I draw my face portrait again, briefly. So now we need to be a little bit more, more precise here. So let me redraw my face. So this is a question, right? This is a question about the profile. This has nothing to do, right? This is something. So, so and, and, and you know, this is a quasi-linear question. This question does not arise if I have a semi-linear wave equation because this does not depend on the self-similar solution. It's given to me. Okay? But this, in this case, it certainly does. Okay? So this is a quasi-linear qu question. So if I, if I draw my face portrait again, briefly, so this is sigma omega, so I have this and this, so I know that I have this, and I know that my trajectory is going to come here and it's going to go back down. Okay, so my problem is here. P2, this is my sound cone or light cone if I want to make the analogy with the wave, with the wave equation. So now I need to ask myself how many derivatives uh, do I need? So you do your, so it all depends on how your profile, on, on how your profile behaves. It depends on the behavior of the profile at P2. Okay, and in particular what you discover is that, uh, uh, so in fact K depends, you can, if you want K min, uh, in fact it's related, it's, it depends on R minus R star, where R star is this, this weird value, G plus L over L plus quarter of T. And as a matter of fact, uh, 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 the closer you take R from R star, the larger you need K min. Okay, there is, uh, this is really algebra. You, you realize that there, there, there is some con consolation. So now I need to be more, more specific. So at first hand you say, okay, fine, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be able to do that. But now I need to Wait, be- So K, K yeah. minimum means a minimum number of derivatives. So what I want, I'm asking the following question. How many derivatives do I need so that when I compute the measure, okay, I want the measure to vanish on the light code? Because if it does not, initially, say you work with H1. It's an H, I don't know how many super, super critical problem. This is not going to work at all. Initially, it's very bad. Alpha is minus 10. Okay, so alpha k is you. So you need to, but, but you know that when you take derivatives, which in some sense the, the problem remembers if you want, uh, simply the, the simple semi-linear structure. It's just that taking derivative is good for you. It's a machine, it will push in the right direction. So when you compute this number, the bigger the k, the best you are. Okay, and as a matter of fact, you can compute this number. You can compute exactly how this number depends on your profile. Okay, but then I have bad news. My bad news is the following. I'm taking derivative of the equation. My profile is in the picture. You have to be very careful. I told you that my profile at P2 is not the infinity. Okay? And my profile has a problem at P2. Careful. My profile at P2, there's an issue. As I said, so uh, let me draw this again. So maybe I should. Okay, so I'm, I'm arrived. So let's say I'm arriving, I'll, I'll, I'll draw this again. So I have this. And I have this. And, and, and what I said the other day is that at P2, you should think of it this, this way. I don't know, if you wrote rho P of Z, and so P is the profile. So at P2, what you have is the following thing. You have a universal expansion, sum for k equals 0 to bk 
of some number ckz to the minus z2 to the k, okay, plus constant z to the gamma, plus a remainder, I'm sorry, this is, this is z minus z2 to the gamma, plus remainder, which depend on z, and where I said that gamma, you should think of it this way, it's 1 over uh, r star minus r, and uh, k is the integer part of gamma. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that, remember, this phase portrait, they are indexed on this parameter r. I want to be in the range r less than r star, because otherwise it's not the right picture, okay? And what I'm saying is that when r is less than r star, if I look at any of the integral curves that enter p2, except an exceptional one, there is a, all the integral curves, they share the same universal expansion. These numbers do not depend on the trajectory. And the Cauchy problem shoots on this thing here. Okay, so but what does it mean? It means that any trajectory that crosses, if you want, comes with a number like this. And in particular, this guy, always assume that gamma is not an integer, because otherwise the, the, it's, it's even worse. So if gamma is not an integer, so this indexes for trajectories. Okay, so this means that this guy has limited regularity. I cannot take more than exactly k derivatives. Okay, so now you do your algebra, and what I mean, my problem is that k min, at least that's what we find, is k plus 1. There is nothing I can do if you want things to push for you. The number of derivatives that we need to take so that if you want the operator, spectrally speaking, is correct, that is, I need this alpha to be positive, Unfortunately, it's exactly equal to uh, the regularity of my profile plus one. That's what we find. So maybe there is another way to spectrally realize the operator, but if this is what you want to do, uh, uh, this, is, this is a fact. This is a, this is a computation. Okay? You just sit down and do this computation. So what does it mean? It means that you know, this is very frustrating because you could very well send R to R star. A priori, R is free. So you can have as many as much regularity as you want. That is, the regularity of this guy, this gamma, can be huge. Nevertheless, whatever you do, you need to be above. And I think this is a very quasi-linear phenomenon. It's telling you that the solution carries its own scaling, right? Which is, which is the speed r. It's exactly this thing. And everything that happens on the light cone is exactly related uh, to this computation. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that we are not able, but to, to not think that this is end of story, I don't know, but we are not able to realize this linearized operator uh, in a decent spe spectral way if what we're working with is a generic search curve. Okay, I don't know what to do, my problem is here. The only hope, okay, so maybe now I can erase, uh, no, maybe I should keep this equation, I, should, I keep it. Yeah, I can erase that. So let me look at that. Excellent. So my, my only hope hope. So now I need to be I'm sorry, I need I need to take a minute to redraw this thing. So let's be a little bit more careful. So I need to draw this. So I have I redraw my face portrait. So this is sigma, this is omega. This is this, this is this. So this is this is delta equals zero. Then I have something here which is a mess. Hop. So I have a unique trajectory, that's the one I'm interested in. So here I have a slope. So I have a unique trajectory that comes from infinity from, from over there. And and then what I want, I want it to go here. So my point is the following, if gamma, so gamma is 1 of r, r star minus r, so it's positive, and in principle it can be taken huge if I want to. So I'm asking the following question. So obviously, so let me put it, put, put it this way, if I take any of the curve that goes through P2, then I have this limited regularity, it kills me for spectral analysis. So I'm asking the question, However, so, but the point is the following. Passing through P2, there is always a unique solution that's infinity. I just take C equals zero. 
Right. My expansion there, remember, the, the C, it's the Cauchy problem for the trajectories. It indexes the trajectory. Should I just take C equals zero? But it's a unique one. So the question is, can I choose R, which is my only free parameter, such that the unique C infinity solution that crosses here coincides with the unique solution that comes from, 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 from infinity? Okay, so can I choose R question? Can I choose? R such that C, if you want, is zero, which means that the solution is C infinity when passing through P2. Okay, if I can do that, in some sense, I don't care for C infinity, I just care for K plus one, but that's, that's the only way we found, right? So now if I, you know, I can do whatever I want with, with my number of, of derivatives, but this is the question. Can you choose are such that, in fact, the unique guy that comes from there is going to coincide with the C infinity solution that passes through P2. And of course, then you need to, let me remind you that when you pass this point, then three things can happen to you. you. You can go there, that's bad, but that's a, an exceptional trajectory. Or then you flip a coin 50-50, you cross green or you cross red. Either you go up or you go down. Okay, so not only do I want to be the C infinity solution, I want to cross red. OK, so this is the, uh, the question. So maybe let me just take five minutes. So say I can, right? And le le let me close, because my equations are here exactly. So say I can. Say the answer is yes. So say, so assume yes. Okay, so pretend that you've done that. You've, you've been able to find R such that, in fact, there's a miracle when you pass through P2, you're, you're as smooth as you want. So you can do this. You can take as many derivatives as you want, and, you can, and then you will discover that, indeed, once you've taken sufficiently many of them, then uh, uh, you do get a bound, you, you do get an estimate, uh, uh, at least for the highest number of derivatives in your equation, that is, when you commute with uh, a k derivatives, you can realize uh, your operator with a measure that now vanishes on the code. Okay, then what you will find, if you keep just the higher, if you just keep a uh, 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 higher order derivatives, actually, it's a little bit more tricky than, than that, but let me say that roughly, roughly, what you should expect is, you know, a Melzag type uh, 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 of monotonicity formula. So the expectation is typically something like this. So remember, did I erase? Yes, I erased it. So you will have something like that. You will have dd tau of some quantity, you know, something that is going to see space derivative. Maybe, so maybe this is z minus z2 now. z minus z2 to some power, you know, alpha. And maybe it's the generator, actually. You have an alpha plus one. And you, know, you compute, you control space uh, derivative of phi, and then maybe uh, uh, time derivative of phi. So this is phi k. This is where phi k is Laplace k phi. OK, so maybe you control a large number of, of derivative, and this is dz. And, and you will find that it's equal to what? Well, exactly, if you remember in the Melza, you had some, some, something like this. Well, you had, so just have rho times some, something. So you have some function, I don't know, A6, which depends on the profile, times d tau phi squared. And maybe this is divided by z minus z2 times the same kind of thing, z minus z2 to the alpha, dz. Right, this is what you should expect. Something like this. That is, you can produce, you know, some sort of a vector field that, 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 that is going to give you this kind of identity, but then there is something that is not for you to choose. It's given to you if you have the semilinear heat equation, but here it's not given to you. You know, these kind of quantities, again, these are, you should think that you do your algebra, these are functions that depend on the profile. Okay, so you need a sign. I need a sign. I need repulsivity. Something has to push for me. It's not given to me at all. It's whatever it is. So, so and of course, there is no formula for this guy. So this is unfriendly. So the sign has to come from the ODE of the profile itself. And this is what we check. Yes. 
This is what I call rep rep repulsivity. That is the fact that indeed, when you compute this kind of, you know, the, the, this is what you want. The principal part comes if you want your vector fields, gi gi some, 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 something is kicked away, and, 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 and it gives you some decay. Okay, the correct spectral framework of this, of course, is the framework of maximal accretivity. Okay, so what you've done here, you've simply said, this is the framework of maximal accretivity. What you've simply done is that you've realized if you, want, if you write your wave equation, so you can write it as a function, you, know, you have something like theta of phi, theta of phi, this is your variable x, You've written it as mx, you, so you want to solve this plus nonlinear x. And what I'm saying is that what I'm doing here is I'm producing a norm such that when I compute the scalar product of mx x with this norm, and its norm, this scalar product, if you want, corresponds to taking derivatives of my equation, and of course, with this kind of measure, then what I'm going to discover is that this is bigger than some constant with my dependent k times the norm of x itself. Okay, so of course this is never going to be true. You know, this is this is this is never go, 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 going to uh, to uh, be true. What I should think, so maybe this is an M tilde. So this would be maximal ac accretivity. But what I can say is that I can realize M tilde as being M plus A. A is typically generated, you know, by perturbation generated by the profile. So A is a compact perturbation of M. If you want compact perturbation in my Hilbert space H K. Right, this is what I told you for the heat equation. I mean, of course, if you add the profile, then it can create eigenvalues. Okay, so the machinery here is that this is a machine. Right, what this thing does is that it may create finitely many eigenvalues. Okay, so this is, this is what this machinery is, is about. So what this is telling you is that if you take a norm with sufficiently many, many derivatives, you can realize, you can form a Hilbert space and realize the linear operator as being a compact, and actually it's a finite rank perturbation of an operator for which this kind of repulsivity estimate is going to give you, is going to mean maximal accretivity. And then you are in a standard framework where you know that modulo finitely many uh, eigenvalues, which you need to mod, mod out dynamically, then you have a spectral gap. Okay, and your spectral gap is exponential decay. Okay, so this is the machine to get D, D, D so, so this is the, the abstract machinery to get decay. So now there are two things that remain to be done. There are two things that, uh, and, and, and I should say that, uh, and I, 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 let me say that, so, so, this is, so this is, you know, this is an abstract uh, spectral framework of maximal creativity. And I should say that in the context uh, uh, of the wave equations, the first who, who, who were to actually use explicitly uh, this thing, this was in this work of Dunninger and Sorkuber, they were the first one to actually use this. So this was for thermilinear wave equations. So this was back in 2008 or something like this. But you know, they certainly have a point that this kind of abstract machinery can be used uh, 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 in this context. And uh, you know, because of the quasi-linear structure, it's, um, uh, uh, it's important. So what is left to be done? So let's just take two minutes. What is left to, to be done? So what have we done here? What we've done here is that we've understood the machine. So if this is y, if this is the origin, if this is, I don't know, maybe this is z, I call it z. So this is z2, this is my light cone. Then maybe uh, we've computed, we found exponential decay here, exponential decay in time. Modulo finitely many eigenvalues, and we've learned how to do that. You can mod them out. There are various ways in, in which you can do this. So you have three problems. Of course, problem one, uh, you need to understand, it's exactly like for the heat equation. Controlling your flow here is certainly not going to be enough. I want to control my flow everywhere because I have perturbations, etc. I cannot leave just by an estimate in, in the code. So the first thing I need to do, I need to pass the code. Okay, and it's a standard difficulty because my measure degenerates on the cone. So the question is, how do I pass the, the cone? So there are several ways in the literature in which this has been addressed. 
uh, uh, at the end of the day, the truth is the following. There's no cone. I mean, you know, the, the, the self-similar solution sees a given cone, but the operator does not. All you need to remember is that all this business is an artifact of, of, of renormalization. You need to use the fact that, you know, in particular, this guy here is here to, is here to, to help you. So, so some of our, my collaborators like to think they like to realize the, exactly as you would like to do it, Sergio. They like to think of it as you know being the flow near horizon, and there is a redshift effect hidden in the picture. This is exactly a posteriori how you can think about this. I like to think about it by simply saying that it's just an artifact of, of renormalization. If you change variables, if you shift things a little bit, you will see this degeneracy uh, disappear. And this is how we, we do it in, 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 in the paper. So if you change a little bit variables, uh, you can pass the code. It's a, it's really there is you know there, it's, it's, this is the fake this is, this singularity is an artifact of your change of variables. Once you've propagated once you've propagated estimates beyond the cone, then it's a different world. You know exactly what you're doing. Then, in some sense, it becomes a wave equation, and you use exactly uh, what I told you. Then the machinery that didn't work because it couldn't work globally. Uh, is, uh, turns out to be extremely efficient here. You can simply close thing by standard Sobol F estimate. You see, I, I like to think of it, it's a propagation in space that is, I have an estimate uh, when z is small, I have a certain estimate in time, which is some dk in time, and what I need to do as z gets bigger and bigger, I'm going to bootstrap a similar estimate. I just need to agree that I need to lose on the dk in time. But it's fine. It's given to me Sobol F estimate, the renormalization that I showed you. They're precisely meant to, to do this. That is, there. this is a machine to understand. You know, think of it this way. If I look at what my blue up solution looks like in original variable, I'm concentrating and I'm becoming huge. So I zoomed in. And of course, I, so this is y, this is x. And what, I, what I'm trying to say is the following thing. Of course, so um, maybe this is z. z is x over lambda. I think it's x over uh, t minus t, if you want. So of course, when I am uh, uh, in the cone, so in the singularity, this is like t minus t, I am with a certain size uh, 1. So here, I have some estimate in time. I look like my profile plus something very nice. But of course, if I am, say, of x of size 1, that is when z is of size 1 over t minus t, I should look in a very different way, in particular because my profile does not decay well, but I want my solution to decay well. OK, so in fact, the, 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 the kind of estimate that you have here and the kind of estimate that you have here should be very different. So what you have in the middle is simply, if you want an interpolation, uh, you know, what, whatever is here, you propagate it using scaling and the sub f norm, and it will exactly give you uh, uh, estimates in, 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 in the middle. Right? So it's all about starting somewhere and propagating, uh, propagating the, uh, yeah, the estimate. Propagating by scaling? So I mean that, <laughs> you know, I told you, if you try to run control of sub f norms and et cetera, the profile is not going to agree with it. But it's not going to agree with it because of this region here. As soon as you move away, actually, if you want sort of more standard, you know, think of it, I'll, 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 I'll rephrase it like this. Think, think of it this way. I don't know how to produce uh, uh, really uh, vector fields that would give me really uh, dissipativity in this region. I need to appeal to some abstract spectral statement. But once I have the decay there, then we can construct vector fields here that actually are really going to push so for energy you. Estimates. Energy estimates. Okay. This, is, this is exactly, this is energy estimates. The, the, the only point I want to make is that it's really space time. That is, the amount of decay that you should expect depends on where you are. Yeah. You cannot expect something uniform. It's, it's because what you're trying to describe is this. So what happens here? What happens here is very di di different. So this is the only thing I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say that you need to propagate some, something. The rate of decay in time depends on where you are in space. Okay, but in some sense, this is something that we and other groups have learned how to do uh, on other problems. Uh, 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 the fact that it's energy estimates uh, 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 makes things very nice. Of course, as you know very well, this is a quasi-linear problem. 
So, of course, we have a serious problem of loss of derivative if you do energy st estimate stupidly. So, of course, you don't want to do energy estimate stupidly. You have to keep the full profile, etc. You have to do the right thing so that you don't stupidly lose derivative in the middle. Okay, it's just part of the annoying structure of the problem, and it's it's easily done. I mean, you this uh, this is no big deal in the, in in this case. Okay, and then once you have this, of course, you need to close your nonlinear term. But you know, in some sense, this is like you know, old-fashioned grandpa mathematics. I mean, with taking tons of derivatives in the equation. So, you know, in some sense, closing the nonlinear term in this case. Of course, you have to propagate decay. You have to, you know, check an, a number of things. But in some sense, it's a simple large Sobolev uh, 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 regularity. If if you want, so there is nothing. Uh, it's a huge bootstrap, and you close everything by hand. Okay, there is nothing. Uh, it's just you know, it's, it's all about the norms. Okay, you have to be a little bit ca careful, but at the end of the day, it's not. A, and and for NLS, there is one other thing that's a little bit annoying. You need to track that you don't vanish, right? Because I'm writing something in phase in modulus, I want to make sure that you know my modulus, my correction is really smaller than my my initial modulus, and you know you have to be careful about what's happening there. You have to be a little bit careful. I don't want to see a singularity. Uh, because that, uh, um, my complex number va vanishes, right? I do not want this to happen. Okay, but at the end of the day, this is the this is the uh, uh, this is the program. Okay, so let me just maybe in the last ten minutes just explain. So I have one problem. Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes. Per perfect. So le let me explain. Okay. No, no, ten, and then a few questions. Okay, so the plan, the plan is this one. So there is one question mark. Uh, 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 there is one question re remaining. So maybe it's so, so maybe I can start it uh, over there. It's this, it's this question here. Okay, so how can I? So how can I understand uh, uh, this 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 problem? So so this is P two. So I need to understand this. I need to understand. I need to understand the C infinity solution that passes through it. Okay, and I need to ask myself. So, 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 so this is so. Let let me say this well again. So, so for example, if this is omega. So if I if I write omega as a function of z, or maybe this is x because x was log z. Maybe this is simpler. So if I write omega of x, let me say these words again. I have some any solution that passes through P2 can be written as a sum uh, uh, from 0 to bk. So I have universal number ck x minus x2 to the k plus a constant uh, 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 x minus x2 to the gamma plus high order. Uh, and high order, you, you understand the way it works, uh, are influenced by z, by c. Okay, and again, gamma, uh, I'm sorry, is k plus alpha, and alpha is strictly between 0 and 1. Okay, and uh, again, and gamma is uh, uh, essentially 1 over r minus r star. So r star is given to me, it's a function of dnl. So actually, it's the other way around, sorry. It's 1 over r star minus l. Okay, so uh, this is what I want to do. So again, uh, this is something, so I'm going to be very explicit in a second. So if gamma is an integer, there is no C infinity solution. There is a log here. Oh. It's a disaster. I don't want to see, I don't want to see this case, okay? The, which is the weakness of this problem? The C infinity solution I'm interested in disappears when I am an integer, okay? Which is the key. So this is the, the first thing. The second thing uh, is the following thing. So in general, this is a question you could ask for for so re really the the way you should think of it is exactly this so you you evolve r such that gamma varies from k to k plus one at the boundary you know that the c infinity solution disappears so something con concentrates in in a way or another and you ask yourself as I evolve gamma or r in between these two integers. What does the C infinity solution do? And is there a way to understand that, in fact, for a well chosen value of r, it's going to coincide with this guy, which is always there? This guy is always there. 
OK, that's the question you ask. OK, so we gave an answer to this question. Uh, 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 so we, we, we answered, we, we gave the very partial par uh, answer. So we answered yes in some regime. We can do that. And the regime that we choose is when R actually goes to R star. Uh, by inf in inferior value. So what I claim is that there are values, uh, uh, well-chosen values. So I can think of it this way, if, if, if you want. Uh, uh, if you go from, if you want, these are kn, kn plus 1. So you have to think that uh, uh, gamma n uh, is 1 over r star minus rn. Right, so when I evolve, so if I take n large enough, so if I'm close enough to r star, then we can find in any uh, large, so there is an issue of parity. I think you need to be, uh, I think k needs to be even or some, some or odd. I, I, I never know, one, one of the two. But if you choose uh, uh, R star in this, in this region, then you will be able to find a solution so that it works. OK, so what's the point with this value? What, what, what is special with R star? So it's very clear, R star is the guy. It's a very specific value. It's the, so I, I said this the other time. We need r less than r star because this is the attractor p5. I want p5 at the left of p2. r star is the value for which these two guys collide. It's when p5 goes to p2. And when, when, so it means the following. It means that when these two guys collide, what I have, uh, so this is, this, is, this is red. This is... Sorry, I need red. That's okay. This is this is red. Okay, so I'm just zooming in. Okay, so this is P2. This is P5. So I have a unique solution, which is so I, everybody has the same slope here, and I know that there is a unique trajectory I'm interested in that comes from over there. Okay, it's over there, and then what I'm doing is I'm sending P5 to P2. And then the first thing you should ask me, what's the, the geometry? What do these slopes do? So what this thing does, it shrinks. Okay, so all tensions. So at the end of the day, you, you, you have um, the, if you want, as, uh, the, the end point would be something li like uh, this. I suppose it's something like this. Right? This is what you would have at the end of the R going to R star case. So you have a degenerate uh, uh, triple point here. OK, so what you want to do, and maybe, OK, five minutes. Uh, it's very clear. What do you want to do? So, so what we will do, so we understand things in the limit when R goes to a star. So it's, it's very clear. So what does it mean? It means that I want to send, if R goes to a star, it means that I want to send gamma to infinity. OK? So what does it mean? What I'm trying to understand is the following thing. I have a problem where all trajectories share the same Taylor expansion at the point x2. All trajectories, they have the same thing. What I'm trying to understand is what, the, what is the impact of this number here. Okay, And I'm trying to do this, uh, uh, and, I, and, I, and of course, more specifically, what I'm trying to understand is what happens if I do this equals 0. Okay, I really want to look at the solution so that this is 0. So I, what, what I'm trying to do is I'm really trying to compute this, this trajectory. And I know that this problem has a weakness. This problem has a weakness in the sense that I know that, think of it this way, when you compute your Taylor co coefficient, so imagine you compute the CK Taylor co coefficient, the weakness is that I know that if I have an integer, then the CBK term is going to get huge. Right? Because I know that if I, you know, I'm going to have, when I, when I compute my Taylor, co so think of it this way. If you compute, if you compute the CK, but you compute the CK, so you will typically find something like this. You will find K minus, I don't know, some value K naught, uh, 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 CK plus one, C, maybe CK plus one is equal to a certain number of times CK plus whatever. Okay, so what you want to do, so K, K naught is given to you, so may, may, maybe actually it's BK, uh, you know, it's, or maybe it's BK plus alpha, something like, like this. So what, what I mean is the following thing, you see, because this is, this is gamma, 
So indeed, when gamma is an integer, I cannot compute. It cancels, so I cannot compute the, the next term. But as soon as I'm not an integer, of course, I can always compute, except that when I get close to integer, some number gets huge here. Yeah. Okay, so it means that the key to this analysis is simply to say, I need to understand, I need to understand, I need to compute, I need to compute CBK. Asymptotically, I need to compute the value of, of, of this guy. So this is as gamma goes to infinity. Okay, so you have, if you want, you have a nonlinear ODE. So you have, you know, you have something like, you have a, a degenerate point. So you have something like, you know, schematically, it's something like this. It's something like you have B minus X, X omega double prime plus a certain number of time omega prime equals a nonlinear number of time omega. So B is a small parameter. B is, you know, B is related to uh, R star minus R. And what you have to do, what you have to do is that you have to compute the, you just send in the Taylor expansion. So you have, you know, you just say that omega is the sum of the CK Z minus, so maybe I put an X also, X to, X to uh, the K plus etc. And then you have an induction series. You have an induction series. For uh, uh, omega k, uh, for ck. Okay, and then my point is the following. Uh, my point is that uh, first of all, you have to put the equation in this form. So this you can do, and so you know exactly what's going on here. If you remember uh, uh, ODEs 101, what I'm facing here is a non-degenerate singular point. Okay, because at x equals zero, if b is non-zero, then I'm fine. Which means that I will always be able to compute my ck coefficient as long as I'm not an integer. Of course, it's very nonlinear. You have a nonlinear term there, right? So you have to think that some, some, something is bad. But this problem has a weakness. Because my eye is like this, after renormalization, uh, formally, when R star goes to R, this B goes to zero. So I'm seeing this. But this is a different world. This is a degenerate critical point at x equals zero, which means that, of course, the linear solution is e to the minus 1 over x. So it's not. Taylor expansion, it's Gevray. It means I should grow. Okay, so my expectation, so when B is non-zero, the Taylor coefficient of this guy, they should grow like crazy. CK should grow like gamma to the K. That's certainly what you expect. And my point is the following thing. There is a weakness here. You see, when we first look at this, we were very worried. That's, that's awful. I mean, I have, I have a, so I have a formal limit problem. And when I look at, at, at regularity, Gevray regularity, but this thing is growing like crazy. So my nonlinear term, when you do PDE, you have growth in the linear term. The nonlinear term should get wild. This is even worse. How am I going to put my hands onto this? I need to control this number. I need to understand what it's like. But of course, this is not a nonlinear term. We understand it. This is a convolution. This is a convolution. This is, you know, I have terms like omega squared or something like this. So imagine, write down the k Taylor coefficient of omega squared. This is the sum for k1 plus k2 equal k of omega k1, omega k2. OK, but this thing is growing like crazy. So in fact, the biggest term like this is just the first term. The other terms, they're ridiculous. Because this is growing like crazy. OK, so this problem looks very nonlinear, but actually it's not really. It's, it's all about this, this, this convolution scale. So, the, so we have a limit problem for which we have an enormous growth of the, of, the, of, the, of the Taylor coefficient, but precisely this enormous growth makes the nonlinear term weaker and weaker in the sense that these terms are empty. So it's fakely nonlinear. That's something you can count. You know, all we need is our sterling. You, know, you, you need to count. It's, it's a bit painful, but, but this is what this is about. And so what's the point? Is, so the point is that for the limit problem, when b is 0, we can understand. So there is no big k. We understand the sequence ck. Okay, we sort of have an asymptotic. We are able to say, well, what's, what, what do we say? We simply say for b equals 0, asymptotically, you are given, you will behave linearly. But of course, modulo a number, so you will behave, if you want, ck will behave like a constant times gamma to the k, roughly. And this is a nonlinear number. 
in a sense that, of course, this number comes from all these ugly uh, terms here, but if you could manage to say that they are in some sense getting weaker and weaker, it's because some series is convergent, some, something is dampening. This number is exactly this S infinity there. Okay, so it's a nonlinear number. We don't know how to show that it's non zero. This is what we do on the computer. Okay, this is the check that we need to do. We need to check that for some you know, reasonable values. This is non-zero. In some sense, uh, I, I, you know, it'd be nice to have an analytic proof there. But, but this is something, this is really just a number. This is a series, right? I have an induction series. I need to check that some number. I know that it converges. I need to check that, 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 that it's non-zero. Then once you have this, you go back to this problem. And you say, careful, I don't have b equals 0. I have b non-zero. This is analytic. Okay, so now you need to ask yourself, uh, of course, analyticity is, is not this, right? I'm going to start de decaying. So now what you need to understand is that, of course, if you draw k, then initially, if you want for k small or of size 1, you will see uh, the Gevray regularity, but that's how it will start growing. But then something will saturate, right? So you need to understand what's the size in terms of b, what's the kb, such that, and you're, are, you, are you, so because I'm interested in this guy. In this big K. Mm -hmm. So am I in the Gevray region or am I in the analytic region? Am I before or, or I'm so the claim is that I am in the Gevray region. You you can count this. So it means that to compute this number, so C B K, to compute this number, it's enough to know that it's totally related to, to this number. That is, it's a perturbation of this number. Okay, which means that indeed uh, uh, the Gevray regularity, be, because I'm going to stop, is enough to understand what's, what's happening here. Once you control your Taylor expansion, you can do, you, you see, think of it this way. Now I control this number. And now if I control this number, I know what's going on here. Because you see, what's going to happen is the following thing. Of course, when x, so imagine that I'm, in, I'm interested in the last term, c to the bk. Of course, I control my whole t Taylor sequence. So think of what this guy do. This is, this is, of course, some sort of serving classical limit. At k equal bk, this is huge. So initially, when you're on p2, this is nothing. But immediately, you will start seeing it. And what I mean by immediately is the following thing. Of course, what's the C infinity solution? The C infinity solution is the solution that starts with this. This is 0. And I have a higher order term. But of course, higher order now is just a fixed point depending on this. Okay, so I can construct the C infinity solution, of course. It's, it's just a fixed point. I just say correction, and, uh, and I, I know that I can control my correction on a certain region around P2. Okay, but because I know the size of this number, I can estimate how far I can go so that I still control the correction. Right? It's all about if you control your, your Taylor expansion, you know, you know if, you co if you control your Taylor polynomial, you can exactly say till when in space, do I control the C infinity solution? And, and what does it look like? OK, so, what we, so it means you don't control it everywhere, but you control it, and, and I'll be done, uh, far enough. And what we say is the following word, is that if this is, yeah, if this is my i, what we say is that as we evolve, as we evolve, so you should think of it the, this way. So let me erase, and I'll be done. So I erase this. When we evolve. When we evolve the parameter in between k and k plus 1, so maybe there is some boundary that needs to be avoided. When we compute the C infinity solution, so what we can say is the following thing. So there is a separatrix solution, which after renormalization, it's constant. So what we can say is the following thing. On one side, what you can show is that the C infinity solution that you compute so in this range, what it does is that it will exit, and in fact, it, it will touch it will, you know, it will touch a given neighborhood here of the separatrix. So it means that, for example, if you are on one side, you will, you will all the trajectories they will arrive here. And then, just by looking at the ODE, you will discover that in fact all these trajectories they must exit. Okay. So, so again, c is zero. I'm deforming the parameter here. What we see is that this infinity solution, they always exit. So it's either green or red. It depends on the parity of k. Okay. So for example, if it's even, they all go in this di di direction. So it's on the left. And this is because there is some monotonicity. It's written in the operator. But on the other side, what it's doing is more mysterious, but because we lost the monotonicity. But what you can show is that if you're here, and if you're here, what you can show is that so this will exit here. 
and this will exit here. Uh, so it's uh, it's here. Okay, so it means that that when I am here, I exit. When I am there, I exit. Okay, so as I deform my parameter on the left, they all exit, say green. It's a question of parity. In particular, none of them will be the separatrix. There is no way I can go up there. I need more energy if you want. Uh, I, the the separatrix cannot be infinity. But on the other side, I don't know what it does, but uh, I know that at the end point of my, of my deformation, I need to exit either green or, or, or red. But as a matter of fact, the curve I'm interested in, it's somewhere over here. So these oscillations, they force that there's at least during this deformation, one value where I'm going to get this one. Because I need to be in this corner. I, I, I cannot go away from it. Okay, so there is at least one value of uh, uh, my parameter r in this interval such that I'm going to get the solution that I want. Okay, but the key to this, I mean, all this, th there are two keys. The, the, the main key is to control your Taylor coefficient in what we like to call a semi-classical regime. And the key is Gevray regularity. Your limit problem comes with enormous growth. And, and this, is, this, is, this, is what, uh, this is how we control the, the, the Taylor term. The second thing is this oscillation mechanism, which is simply, this is something you see when you try to compute for the, the next order. You understand what the solution uh, uh, look like. And there is a difference. The left and the right do not behave the same way. And of course, it's an artifact of renormalization. There is no P5 point on the other side. It's, the, the behavior is completely different. So there's a change of nature after renormalization of the problem. So oscillations on the right and no oscillations on the left. And this gives you what you want. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Some brief comments or questions. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, brief. So all this is really an amazing tool to force. Now, um, uh, there are lots of questions, but let's say, that, to be short, just one. I mean, what would happen if you try to do the same thing for the wave equation? But which one? When you, when uh, I mean, what you did for the non for the non equation. equation. Ah, I'm sorry. Super, super. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's a very it's a very in, in yeah it's a very in, it is you're shooting in the middle, so you know for the heat. You know that there is no blow up, uh, uh, and I think for the wave equation, well, there are, there are several kind of. It depends. I think are we talking? You know, I think if we talk about the if you take the complex heat uh, wave, wave if you take it complex, you then maybe this has a chance to go somewhere. Uh, if you look at the scalar, I don't know. I think How it's very. It analogous, so uh, okay, so if you take the scalar wave equation. Uh, and you do exactly what we say, and you look for uh, you know what I call the connection problem. That is the analog of Euler, etc. This is this seems not to go anywhere. Uh, if you do it for the complex wave, then this is very interesting. You see very interesting things show up. No, no, there should be a major difference between the two. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think you know, I think that the complex. Uh, I think the the, the complex is a, is a very interesting problem. It seems to make a lot of sense. Yeah. But is, do you have a? Some, uh, is there any analogous of the Euler equation? Yes, I'll tell you about that. Because, yeah, okay. <laughs> I never ever talk of things that are not written down from A to Z. You know this? You get to talk after the paper is online. Never, never before. Okay. Uh, I have lots of other questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, okay, so uh, yes. Yes, uh, can you just explain the main parts of the bootstrap uh, method? To close the nonlinear problem? Mm -hmm. well, well, so bootstrap is just, you, 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 you know, you, you, you take an awful norm. So you say, I have my awful norm on phi, right? And, you know, you say at time zero, I'm less than uh, one half. You bootstrap, you assume that you are less than uh, three quarter. And this is your boot. And then you prove that you actually have a right. So, so this is just a matter. Uh, how can I say it? it's just energy method? I mean, you know, yes, yes. it's just you know, it's energy method. So maybe there, there is one thing I didn't say. So you have so so you know, think of it this way: you ha you have a linear problem. You have d tau x is m x plus nonlinear. And of course, there is something I forgot to tell you. I have this b square Laplace that is somewhere in in, in the picture. Okay, so. When I do spectral theory, I ignore this guy. 
it gives me estimates at low Sobolev scale, right? So I'm gonna so when when I ignore this, I'm gonna get decay x of tau in some h k naught norm is going to decay exponentially in time. Okay, but of course this is when I do low Sobolev, but 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 when I do high, then I'm gonna bootstrap this. I'm gonna ask for very high Sobolev, and when I do high Sobolev, you see this is exactly the point. Uh, uh, why does the problem does not like high sublet? Because I have my profile in there. But these, it's compact it, in space. It's well localized. So I can boot with the low sublet and put this on the left now. Okay, so I'm going to bootstrap some, some you know, with, with constant C1, C2. So, so, so this is with B square on the left. Okay, and then I have to, all these, all these norms are not good. I need to I need to, I also need to, you know, I need to get, you know, an infinity estimate, an infinity weighted estimates to close my nonlinear term, to close the nonlinear term. Uh, it's the standard thing. I mean, if you have a, if you have phi cube and you take tons of estimate on it, if you take tons of derivative, what you're going to see is phi square nabla k phi. So you need to tell me something about this guy, right? But because you're, you know, and of course we do this with weights and etc. So you have to be careful. But the point is that this is this is what I was trying to say. It's like old-fashioned, you know, energy estimate. Taking high derivatives makes things easy. The problem is the weight. You have to be very careful with your weight in space. But what I'm saying that what I did with with Sobolev norms, I can do it with Sobolev and weights. It's just a scaling issue. So so you know, this is this is this is something we learn how to do on other problems. Okay. Some more questions or brief remarks? Just uh, can you think maybe uh, in your mind of some way of uh, getting rid of the singularity uh, Q? Getting rid of what? The, P, the P2 problem? Yeah, uh, getting uh, uh, rid of the singularity. Uh, on the call? The fact that y is equal to 1 uh, is, is irrelevant? Yeah, it's a change of variable. It's just, you just, you know, we've been thinking about this a lot. So there are, there are various things that could have been tried. I know that Frank and Atem, when they studied the wave equation, they certainly had this kind of issue too. But they were in a semi-linear setting. So they could do things that could not be done there. Uh, at the end of the day, it's just a change of eye. It's completely elementary. It's just that, you know, it's this idea that you have to remember that your operator is not about space only. There is a space-time term. There's a second derivative space-time term in the picture, and it's here to help you. This is all you need to understand. And once you've understood that, and once you understood that you need to rely on this guy, then you see what you have to do. But technically, it's just a change of variable. You, you adapt things. So thank you for all this very nice lecture.